Princess Maker 2 is a game where God gives you a 10 year old from space and you immediately put them to work as a child laborer. Er, no. Princess Maker 2 is a game about usurping the war god and gaining immortality and powers over hell. No, wait. Princess Maker 2 is a game about dance contests. Uh, Princess Maker 2 is like a really sophisticated Tamagotchi. When I first heard about Princess Maker 2, I had a complete misconception. In the West, when we hear the term princess, we're immediately flooded with images of Disney characters, and then products associated with those characters because Disney has spent a lot of money over the past 30 years making sure we all have strong brand name recognition for their Disney princess line. Dresses, dolls, wands, products aimed mostly at small children, particularly little girls, all swirl out of our subconsciousness like so many layers of frills and tulle. So when this princess game boots up and you pick a surname, a birthday, and enter your own age as a player, I thought, wow, I really am playing a princess game for little girls, a bona fide Japanese GFG. Well, boy howdy was I ever wrong. Princess Maker, it turns out, is a 30-something year old JRPG franchise made for Japanese computers, designed by Gainax. Yes, that Gainax. Let that be your first hint that this is not a game made for children. The first iteration of Princess Maker 2 was released in 1993 for some Japanese computer you've never heard of. It received about 30,000 other ports in the intermediate 26 years, including a cancelled and leaked English localization for DOS in 1995. However, it was not fully legally available in English until 2016, when Princess Maker 2 Refine was released on Steam. A Korean company took it, cleaned it up, added voice acting, and a really rudimentary English translation, and released it to the public for Windows operating systems. As for the name Princess Maker, it's misleading for more than one reason, as the majority of the game's content has basically nothing to do with the princess part. The game opens the cutscene explaining the backstory of this world and you, the hero. In medieval somewhere, there was a demon lord named Lucifon who invaded the good people of... something. It's your typical JRPG world, European fantasy inspired with some genre standard twists and real world religion used to set dressing. Think Dragon Quest and you get the picture. You manage to fight him off for now, and that earns you some nice reputation, and a meager pension of 500 gold a year. Oh, and also, a 10-year-old girl from heaven for you to raise as your own, however you please. And that truly is the premise of the game. You have a daughter now, whether you want one or not, and it's your duty to raise her into a fine lady of society, refinement, taste, and the art of combat, and hopefully marry her off to somebody along the way. Could be a prince, could be a nobody, it all depends on how you raise her. There are many tiers of endings, and the game will grade you on how well you do, whether your daughter gets married, whether she has a good relationship with you, whether she finds steady employment as an adult, and whether she pleases the gods by living righteously or racks up enough sin to gain immortality and powers over hell. Yeah, believe it or not, you get negative points for that one. This process is accomplished by tediously writing out her monthly schedule for the next seven years, which is where the meat of the game truly lies. You then run her schedule each month and see how events play out. Sometimes there are random things that occur during the schedule, like getting visited by deities or challenged to duels by strangers, and you get to see how your daughter performs at each thing you told her to do, which can have various outcomes. There are four categories of activities you can put on her schedule, the first of which is work. Work is in most runs going to be necessary, as your pension of 500 a year is not going to be enough on its own to shape your daughter's future. And because it's the year 1200, it's totally acceptable to force your daughter to work in the fields as a 10 year old. Classes, the main stat raising avenue, and the second scheduling option have a per day cost, much higher than what any of the jobs pay, so you're most likely going to need to have your daughter work, not only as a means to make money, but as a free avenue for raising stats along the way. The third scheduling option is errantry, which once you get her combat skill up, works as a more traditional RPG space for adventuring, finding loot, fighting monsters, and meeting helpful NPCs. And finally, there's time off, which is necessary for managing her mental health, as being a child mercenary slash farm worker is very, very stressful. In between schedules, you have opportunities to manage your daughter's diet, change her clothes so that she doesn't get too hot or too cold in harsh weather, manage inventory, buy and sell items, and talk to her to hear her thoughts on things. Like, if you want to. There's also an option to talk to one noble person a month to expand her social connections, including the elusive prince. The closest comparison I can think of for how stats interact in this game is actually the Chow Garden in Sonic Adventure 2, so we can just call this the most complicated Chow simulator ever devised. Much like in the Chow Garden, most of the stats have multiple purposes, and also like the Chow Garden, there are a number of hidden ways they influence your daughter's behavior, her reputation, and other stats. Every stat in the game has its own complicated relationship with another stat, and there are some stats that are required for points in certain endings that you can't see at all. 
There are four main categories of stats, the social stats, combat stats, housekeeping stats, and reputation stats. The former three categories feed into the latter, which determines which category of endings you qualify for. Each category has its own hard and soft caps for individual stats, and whichever of her social stats is the highest will influence her in-game behavior. Additionally, some of the ways these stats can interact can make it harder or easier to manage her health. If you let her stress get too high, she can become delinquent and unruly, joining gangs and stealing your, well, her own hard-earned money. If she has high sin and low faith, her stress tolerance will be worse. If her diet is bad and she has too low stamina, she can become ill and even die. Speaking of diet, there's an uncomfortable emphasis placed on her measurements in this game, and how well you can manage her weight gain and loss. Most of the good late game equipment has a certain weight threshold you have to meet to be able to wear it, and you can get stat penalties for being overweight. This is a game from Japan in the early 90s, but regardless it can be more than a little troubling at times. Put a pin in that, we'll come back to it. Anyway, how well you manage these things will impact her relationship with you, and she can lose reputation points, points in hard to earn stats, and many other ill effects like loss of precious time and money if you play fast and loose and aren't careful. Likewise, if you're an excellent father, she'll appreciate you and bake you a cake on your birthday each year, or even marry you. Ugh. Incidentally, that's the only special marriage in the game that doesn't get a Steam achievement. There's also the clock to think about. Seven years may sound like a long time, but if you get to age 14 and still can't win the yearly harvest festival, you might be in trouble for locking in the reputation points you need for whatever ending you're going for. The two main influences on stats, which are work and classes, almost all have at least one stat they raise and another they lower. Some jobs have prerequisite stats you need to raise in order to do them successfully and earn decent money at them. Some stats are easy to raise early in the game, and some are easier to raise late in the game or through errantry and special items and events. So ultimately, you'll get the best results if you go in with a plan for what you want to specialize in, and do work and study things that all contribute toward that goal. The strategy comes in to how you route her care as a child to get the result you desire when she becomes an adult. Mostly in your first run of the game, you're not going to know at all what you're doing. So thankfully in the last 30 years someone made a helpful wiki, and some other person made an FAQ. So you can look up what the various choices you can make impact. But you do really have to learn how all the stats feed into and interact with one another to play successfully, regardless of which ending you're pursuing. One of the best parts of the game is how each stat informs who your daughter becomes as a person. Unlike most RPGs that have a focus in combat above all else, your little girl can be proficient and deficient in many areas of life. There are over 70 possible endings, so you can end up needing to manipulate and tweak stats really specifically to get the results you want. Mind you, only a single one of these endings involves marrying a prince and becoming a princess. You can aspire for much greater, becoming a ruling queen for example, or worse, killing the demon lord and assuming his role as the queen of hell. Even within each ending, her stat spread can help determine what kind of person she'll be. Although normally, ending the game with enough sin to become the Queen of Darkness is enough to net you negative points overall, you can't actually finagle a positive score with this ending if on top of her oodles and oodles of sin, she also has high morality and maternal instinct. A good, kind, and decent evil Queen of Hell. Your daughter represents endless possibility, and seeing how your choices impact her growth is what makes this game so much fun to play and replay. This game may sound kind of overwhelmingly complicated, but honestly, learning as you go and understanding the way these stats flesh out the character of your daughter and the world around her is what makes this game kind of addictive, even in spite of some of the glaringly icky things about it. There's at least a textbook worth of information about all the different stats, jobs, and features of the game, and slowly mastering these things as you go is really gratifying. Around every corner is another mystery for you to solve. The mystery of, why is my daughter running away? The mystery of, how do I help my daughter marry the demon lord, or become a successful hairdresser? It helps you get into the role of being a father and slowly learning how to parent. And the more you learn, the better seeing your daughter grow into a successful adult feels. Think about the chow garden, how fun it is to learn what breeding different combos of chow results in, even though there are no explicit rewards built into the game to encourage players to do that. How good it feels to figure out the stats and be able to manipulate specific behaviors and performance in things like races. There should be a word for games that are fun to learn for their own sake. Games with secrets waiting to be discovered and researched and studied. Maybe... Mystery Box? Nah, that's stupid. Part of the learning is asking questions. What does this stat do? Why is it like that? What is the in-world logic? What is the relationship between having high sensitivity and being able to talk to fairies? What are the benefits of having high glamour and what are the downsides? What do I gain by having my daughter take time off every month? 
what do I lose? There's something about this kind of game, about the feeling you get from nurturing a character and seeing them thrive from your care, that can open up a world of introspection. As you learn more about the games, you also learn from these games the relationship between mental health and performance. When you successfully manage your daughter's stress and diet, she's easier to raise, more obedient, and less expensive to care for. So naturally, as you ask those questions to try to figure out more of the mysteries of the game, you end up asking similar questions comparing how you would care for her and how you take care of yourself. Do you have a healthy diet with enough calories and nutrients to get you through the day and keep you from getting sick in the long term? Are you taking time off once a month? What happens when you don't? Do you have less energy and do worse at work? Do you get sick more easily? Do you go on shopping sprees and spend irresponsibly when you're stressed? There's a concept in mental health called self-care. When you take better care of yourself, give yourself the time to be happy and healthy, you perform better in all areas of your life. This is a necessary thing to do, even if it's not always or ever easy to make the time or budget for unwinding or eating right. In Princess Maker, likewise, it might give you a temporary advantage in some stats or make more money if you don't take time off this month, but eventually if you keep this up, you will take heavy penalties and will have less productive months going forward. One of the benefits of games that actively encourage you to learn them and ask questions about their mechanics is that by putting you in a position to reflect on topics like care and nurturing, you can easily see the parallels and apply the same concepts to how you care for yourself. The game leads by example, encouraging you to think of yourself as the daughter and your own hero dad. That's the beauty of games about nurturing, your pet simulators, your chow gardens, even the sims. Making a skill out of managing needs and honing it has many real world benefits. But before I can heap too much praise on this game, remember that pin we left in some of the more uncomfy stuff? Well, it's time to take the pin out. So considering that this game was indeed not designed to be played by little girls, and rather older men who might want to simulate the role of a father, the female protagonist and main focus of the game is of course explicitly underage for the entire duration of gameplay. And with that being so obvious, there is a lot of uncomfortable fan service in this game. The fact that she can marry you, her adoptive father, is also not to be ignored. This game can absolutely be played as a groom your own ideal perfect fantasy anime wife simulator, and the uncomfortable focus on her measurements doesn't end at just her weight. To qualify for any of the social endings, she must remain thin throughout the game. And there are also specific endings and dialogue choices you can only get if she has a large chest. An entire category of the dialogue found by conversing with the daughter is her making remarks about her own growing body, her chest size, her butt, and so on. Glamour itself is a troubling stat. In the original Japanese version, this stat is called sex appeal. If your daughter has high glamour and loses to a bandit, she'll be assaulted. It's more than a little icky to be managing or even thinking about any child's sex appeal. Children ideally should not be sexually appealing to adults under any circumstances. I do not in any way mean to sanitize any of this stuff or wash over it by talking at length about the strengths of this type of game and the benefits they might have for players. These things are definitely there when you play and they're hard not to notice. You can have a successful run of the game without chancing on some of the more egregious pedo stuff. You certainly don't ever need to buy the matchless robes, for example. But it's impossible to ignore stats like weight and chest size when they're such an integral part of the game. It can be hard to reconcile enjoying RPG mechanics and the really interesting concept of using these stats to shape a character in so many different areas of life, and at the same time noticing the skeevy way in which it's all framed. The good news is, we don't have to throw out media entirely for having pernicious aspects, and in fact, the exposure to these things in this context can actually benefit us. A recent study out of the University of British Columbia by Dr. Kathy Stanford has shown that by engaging with ethical problems in video games, players have a new channel for developing their ethical decision-making in a positive way. When you sit there having a wholesome good time raising your daughter, and all of a sudden realize the game is male gazing at a preteen character from the perspective of her adult caretaker, you get kind of a pit in your stomach. Having that reaction, needing to think about why you feel that way, is flexing that ethical muscle, raising that morality skill, if you will. You have to do the mental work to decide this is definitely wrong. Not that you didn't already know these things were wrong, but if this game were free of any ethical problems, if it were a perfect, raise a feminist, body positive girl boss simulator, I wouldn't ever have had to think through all the problems with this game in this deconstructive way, and having that negative reaction to it reinforced by the pit in my stomach. Video games are uniquely positioned to provide spaces for us to explore heavy real world topics, like body image and appropriate parenting, without endangering any real people. When people do things like run over people in GTA or drown their sims for sport, there's a part of most of us that feels bad about doing them, or at least feels bad about enjoying doing them. 
Even to record footage for this video, needing to do things like make my daughter get sick and die was emotionally difficult. I don't want a child to suffer because of me, even in a video game. But at the same time, most players are at some point going to try to make that happen, out of morbid curiosity about what is actually possible in the game space. Same with getting some of the worst endings that require basically raising your daughter to be a bad person on purpose. Because of the interactive nature of video games, you can see the outcome of personally being a bad father, have that be negatively reinforced by feeling bad about it, and satisfy that impulse without harming any real children for your growth, which is a win-win. This is part of why I spend so much time thinking about the ethics of Pokemon. Aside from just being interesting, exploring things like power dynamics and animal rights within the space of a fictional universe can help better us as people, even if we ultimately enjoy a piece of media without perfect in-universe ethics in the process. So in conclusion, Princess Maker 2 is not only not a game about making a princess, it's a game about teaching us that the real princess was inside all of us all along. And immortality and gaining powers over hell.